Uh, this this dear listener's got a great question. Did God predetermine some people for hell, or is it that His foreknowledge is how He knew who would be the elect and who would not choose Him? Um, what do you say? Well, I mean, Scripture does say that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to eternal life. Uh, I like the way that C.S. Lewis once put it. He said that in the end, there are two groups of people. One group of people says to God, thy will be done. And these are the people who have listened to Scripture, which affirms that we are sinners in need of a Savior. And in recognition of our sin, we turn to the Lord and trust in Christ for salvation. But there's another group of people to whom the Lord says, thy will be done. These are the people who have refused the grace that is in Jesus Christ. They have refused to recognize that they are sinners in need of repentance before the Lord and turning to him in faith. And as a result of that, they suffer the eternal consequence, which is eternal separation from God in a a place that Scripture calls hell and elsewhere the lake of fire. And so that's why God says, thy will be done. You have made your choice. Now, whenever the word elect is used, you don't see the term elect to hell. Elect is always used of the redeemed. And so I don't think that you can say that God elected anybody to hell. I think that even those who hold to a very strong view of election would say that in terms of those who end up in hell, that God simply passed over those individuals in view of their free will choice not to turn to the Lord. And that free will is very important. Do you remember when Jesus was even talking to some of the Jewish leaders while he was still on the earth? And Jesus said to them, How often I wanted to gather you under my wings as a mother hen, but you would not yeah, come. Willing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you were mm-hmm. not willing. Mm-hmm. And so what he desired, what Jesus desired, was for them to come to repentance and to come have a fellowship with him, but they refused. God did not override their free will. And so the people that end up in eternal separation from God in in hell have ultimately made the choice that requires them to be there. And they would be, you know, eternally quarantined, basically, from the redeemed for all eternity. Um, I hate to think about that doctrine, to tell you the truth, Susie, but really it's one of my primary motivations in sharing the truth of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because before that moment of death comes for me, I want to rescue as many people as humanly possible from that destiny. Yeah. And some will listen, some will not. There's plenty of people that I've talked to that will, ref- you know, they've refused, despite the fact that I gave an absolutely clear presentation. And, um, you know, they're going to have to answer for that one day. And the thing is, there are Christians on both sides of this conversation, some believers who believe strongly that there are elect um and that, that you almost don't have a choice in the matter. You know, I've talked with those who have leaders who believe you don't even need to evangelize, really, because there are people who are elected. And then there's the other extreme going, there's, well, I wouldn't I don't know if I'd call it an extreme, but the other side of the aisle is uh, free will and free choice. And then there's just a host of people in between. And, you know, I, I so love where you're landing and what you're saying just as a layperson, because I can't get past he wills that none would perish but the one thing I am asking for friends who land on these places in both sides of this conversation is we could be civil and loving to each other. Because here again, Ron, I've seen some pretty heated debates that get pretty ugly. And I'm thinking, <laughs> is there a way we can walk in fellowship and agree to disagree, you know? Well, I, I would say this. Um, in terms of the disagreement that is among Christians today, there's one group of Christians that says election is based solely on God's foreknowledge. And that's the idea that God looks down through the corridors of time and determines who's going to have an open attitude toward him, who is going to be open to receiving the gospel. And based upon that, he elects them to salvation. Now, there are some obvious problems with that viewpoint, because uh, particularly in the Gospel of John, it just seems to annihilate that viewpoint. But the other viewpoint is that God elects based upon his sovereign choice. Now, they're going to continue to disagree. I've got my own viewpoint. I I tend towards the sovereign viewpoint on this. But regardless of your position, all of the different viewpoints can agree at least on a couple of things. And that is, number one, God's election is ultimately loving. That's what Ephesians 1 verses 4 to 11 tells us. Secondly, election is an act that glorifies God. Both positions can agree with that. Ephesians 1 verses 12 to 14. 
And then finally, number three, both positions can agree that the end result, the product of election, is a people who do good works, Ephesians 2.10 and Colossians 3.12. And so, you know, I may disagree with you, you may disagree with me, but there is stuff that we can agree on. Let's not let the enemy of our souls, Satan, cause us to call each other heretics and have division in the body of Christ, because divided we fall. But united we stand. Amen. Well, I appreciate that so much.